deep in a restricted zone of the French Mediterranean, France's top underwater experts are on a long-awaited mission. Armed with the latest high-tech subsea tools, they're venturing back in time while preparing to explore the moon. La Lune, or the moon, is an ill-fated battleship, once a vessel in the Sun King, Louis XIV's royal fleet. Just back from a crushing defeat by Barbary Coast pirates, the ship sank here more than three centuries ago under questionable circumstances, with nearly a thousand men on board. The loon went missing until 20 years ago when it was discovered by chance, so well preserved and equipped that experts consider it a time capsule of 17th century naval history but it lay too deep to explore without invention and substantial resources. Now a dream team of scientists, divers, 3D virtual wizards, and French naval experts have joined forces to recover the first of the loom's treasures, and in so doing, discover how new technologies can serve to help us resurrect our past. It's spring 2012, near the port city of Toulon. Two renowned deep sea veterans, Paul-Henri Narjolet, expedition leader on the Titanic, and Michel Lour, head of France's Department of Underwater Research and Archaeology, are ready to go public with major news. The announcement of phase one of a recovery mission, 20 years in the making. The focus of our efforts is the Lune, clearly a symbolic name for a ship that was lost during the Sun King's reign. The Lune was built between 1639 and 1642, probably at the shipyards in Indre, near Nantes. The Lune's final voyage occurs in November 1664, after a long, disastrous military campaign by Louis XIV's fleet against North African pirates. The ship's original mission, to reinforce the king's troops, turns into a desperate exodus following a massive enemy attack. Refused permission to dock at Toulon, the ship again sets sail, but swiftly sinks offshore, drowning hundreds of men. For 300 years, the story of the loon was buried with its unlucky crew. But in 1993, as Paul-Henri Najolet tests the research submarine Ephraimer for an upcoming Titanic mission, he detects an anomaly on the ocean floor 300 feet deep. We heard a very distinctive sound through the sonar, so we thought, there's metal down there, not only rocks. So we decided to have a look, and that's when we saw something absolutely amazing. It was the Loon, one of the very few vessels ever found from the Sun King's reign, in remarkable shape, but buried deep. Accessing the wreck would take years of strategizing on the part of Narjolet and Michel Lure, and the coordinated efforts of the French military, high-tech 3D imaging experts, and a host of scientists and engineers. It's taken years of planning, and we're finally here. August 2012. A small team launches remotely operated reconnaissance robots, or ROVs, to scout and photograph the wreck. It's too deep for human divers in regulation gear to explore. Two months later, Operation Loon is underway. Its flagship, the André Malraux, is a state-of-the-art underwater research vessel built specifically for this pioneering mission after years of government lobbying by Michel Lour.
The ship heads for the wreck site with a team of archaeologists and technical experts who've been prepping for this venture for months, eager to test their inventions and touch treasures from the past. Exploration ship Minibex is in charge of the ROV with the expedition's 3D cameras. Michel Lure has also engaged specialists in underwater engineering and treasure hunting. They'll test new technology that could raise the bar for deep sea explorations of the future. And the submarine Remora has been equipped for this mission with a prototype camera to capture images of the shipwrecked loon in 3D. One of Operation Loon's most promising assets comes from the French Navy. They employ the skilled divers of the Syphysmer Institute to defuse torpedoes using a very rare tool, an atmospheric deep sea diving suit called the Newt Suit, which allows them to stay at depths for 48 hours at a time, if necessary. The revolutionary aluminum hard suit features rotary joints in the arms and legs, allowing pilot Joe Kirsch maximum mobility, while withstanding pressure at depths of up to 1,000 feet. It's high-tech underwater armor. There are only 24 suits like this one in the entire world. France only has one, so it's a privilege to pilot it. Joe trains for the mission, where he'll recover objects from the loon and provide Michel Lure's team of archaeologists with first-hand information about the wreck. Near Paris, weeks before Operation Loon begins, Joe pilots a unique simulation for the mission, created by 3D innovators at Dassault Systems. The first job is to move forward, find a cross, and land on it. It's an experimental program allowing archaeologists to see the loon in 3D and to test various excavation techniques on dry land. Dassault Systems engineers used media recorded during the summer scouting trip to reconstruct every inch of the loon in 3D, making it possible for archaeologists to explore the wreck virtually. Project manager Cédric Sima will give it a trial run aboard the André Malraux. One of the unique aspects of this project is that it combines all these immersive 3D technologies on the research ship itself, where we can finally test them in real-life conditions. October 2012, the André Malraux and the rest of the Loon fleet have a five-day window to test their technology in pursuit of 17th century history and revolutionary science. It's an ambitious program for such a short voyage, ultimately meant to change the way we explore the deep sea with new ideas and new tools. Malraux, let me know when you're in position. No problem. I'm almost there, but I'll let you know. To achieve their research goals by the end of the week, each ship will have to deploy its technology with symphonic precision. This morning, three separate devices are being readied for a descent to the loon. The newt suit with its pilot, the submersible remora and its underwater cameraman, and an unmanned ROV recording the dive for scientists topside. For archaeologist Michel Lure, this mission is the first step towards advanced deep sea exploration currently beyond science's reach, shipwrecks thousands of feet deep. And today, if all equipment works, perhaps the loon. It's like a lost city that disappeared suddenly and now it's there. That's what's so fascinating, because we can all dream about this shipwreck. It's so close and yet so far away. At the same time, it's going to serve as a test for future explorations. Here, humans can still dive to access the site. It would be a lot harder, if not impossible, at depths beyond 1,000 or 2,000 feet. On the Navy tugboat, the Jason, tension is rising. 
With the stakes this high, veteran diver Paul-Henri Narjolet will oversee the deployment of men and equipment. Lead diver Joe Kirsch will work in radio contact with archaeologist Lure and his team. His support crew ensure that the newt suit is dirt free. Even a single hair caught in a gasket could create a leak, endangering Joe's life. Paul-Henri Narjolet, a veteran of 30 Titanic dives, knows that the minutes before immersion are critical for safety. It's a hostile, difficult environment. As soon as you're underwater and you dive deep, there's a lot of ambient pressure and the slightest inattention to detail can become an incident. Meanwhile, on the André Malraux, expedition leader Michel Lure orders his team to launch the ROV. It's a robot equipped with a small camera. The French archaeologist will monitor operations via images relayed to surveillance screens. As the site's curator, his job is to protect the loon. It will take the nude suit four minutes to reach the ocean floor. Here, at 300 feet, divers in traditional gear could remain mere minutes, followed by a two-hour ascent with decompression stops. This body armor could keep Joe at constant temperature and pressure levels for hours in waters three times as deep. Support crew on the surface free the suit from its cage and carefully release Joe above the shipwreck by remote control. Soon, long-awaited shapes come into view. the first vestiges of the Sun King's secret shipwreck. Ironically, for the first time, an aquanaut has landed on the moon. Centuries ago, the loon plummeted to the ocean floor. Thick sediment turned it, and all it contained, into a rare time capsule of 17th century French naval artifacts. At his feet, Joe can make out weapons of bronze and iron, dozens of muskets and swords, and pottery from the ship's galley. If you go back to your initial position, we're good. We'll start maneuvering. Let us know if there's a problem. The nude suit's two engines are controlled from the surface. Joe pilots the suit, but depends on his operator, who will start the propellers at his command. The current and the darkness on the ocean floor force the pilot to be vigilant. Joe must hover over the loon to avoid hitting precious objects or damaging the fragile umbilical cord that connects him to the suit's cage and to life. On the Andre Malraux screens, two large jars and a bronze cannon appear in a state of perfect preservation. Two scientists working with the Dassault Systems team on virtual subsea exploration are spellbound by what Michel Luer calls the underwater Pompeii. And what I find amazing is that you find all the cannons well aligned so you can guess what was the shape of the ship. You find the kitchen pots, the cauldrons, right standing there, and then you go down there and you see them, they're still empty, they're standing out. You find the water jars, okay, they just fell off, but you know, they might just have tipped over. It's just 
and there are plates, there are stacks of plates that you can see on the seafloor and pots and it's, it's like everything was kept in place and like an abandoned house that everybody left. And, and it's a little bit like if someone has taken the boat and placed it carefully, yeah, carefully so that we yeah. can look at it and find out yeah. a little bit about the history of yeah. what was going on there. Archaeologists have theories, but no firm proof of how and why the loon sank. But they suspect its fate is linked to politics in the troubled early days of Louis XIV's rule. In 1662, the Sun King is 20 years old. He wants the dawn of his reign to be remembered for a grand achievement, a great military victory. The young monarch intends to create a French post and establish a fleet on the Barbary coast of North Africa. He means to curb the rampant piracy threatening European maritime trade. On July 2nd, 1664, an armada with 50 warships sails out of Toulon bound for the shores of Barbary, now Algeria. Three months later, vastly outnumbered French troops are overwhelmed by Berber warriors as an older supply vessel sets sail for Gigéry. Historian Martine Assera is intrigued by the loon's sketchy story. This period of maritime history under Louis XIV is poorly documented and shipwrecks from this time rare, which makes this one a useful find. The ship is 22 years old. The wood is probably starting to rot. There may be some gaps in its frame. It's probably starting to take on water and being attacked by teredos, the shipworms that bore holes in wood. So it's definitely very fragile, but because there aren't many ships available, we use what we have. The loon will set sail from Toulon with 250 sailors on board. The old ship is laden with supplies, arms, and horses for the expeditionary forces in Gigéry. In those days, they built ships without blueprints or drawings. There are very few graphic illustrations, so we don't really know how they were made and there are very few archival clues to give us an idea how they looked. In this case, the archive is the shipwreck itself. The crew on the loon has no clue their stay in North Africa will be a brief one, nor that French casualties there are so great that officers are already desperate to withdraw their troops. Day one of Operation Loon appears to be off to a good start. Michel Lure is impressed with the images relayed by the newt suit. Now he wants to test his pilot's skills. Aboard the Jason, archaeologist Frédéric Leroy, Lure's technical director, will oversee the delicate maneuvers. The team wants to determine how devices like the suit and the unmanned ROV can best be used on this and other missions. We're taking the suit into a rather cramped space between several cannons to see if it's possible to collect small objects there. It's more precise than the ROV, with much more flexible jaws. So it'll allow us to pick up some things as delicate as a plate more carefully than the ROV's hydraulic jaws that could damage an object. Pilot Joe Kirsch's dexterity, along with his training on Dassault Systems' 3D virtual reconstruction of the loon, are about to pay off. Mm -hmm. 
The Wa hurries to claim the fragile ceramic from the loon, which will be transferred immediately to an eager team of archaeologists on the André Malraux. Preservation of any artifact recovered at sea is a race against time. The sediments that once protected this plate on the ocean floor have also changed its chemistry. Once exposed to the atmosphere, it will deteriorate unless the salts are removed and the object chemically stabilized. And Lure's team has waited too long for the loon's bounty to let that happen, no matter what the treasure. We'll let them clean it up anyway. All this is plain crockery. No, look, there's a design. There's a motif? I think it might be a fish, a symbol. I don't know what you call that exactly, see there? It's an emblem, very stylized, yes. After preliminary research, the team thinks the pottery came from the Italian studios at Pisa. Access to other objects in the Loon's vast inventory should provide insight into how the French Navy lived in the mid-1600s. As research continues topside, pilot Joe Kirsch signals a problem with the newt suit. Turn on the engines. My starboard engine is making a strange sound. It's not normal. You hear it? Sounds like it's grinding. Okay, I'm restarting the engines. See which control it is, and we'll take a look. Okay. The failing engine has practically immobilized Joe. He has to surface, now. The support crew on the Jason manages to recover their pilot without further incident. But the malfunctioning of the newt suit, a key expedition tool for search and recovery on the wreck, has dealt the mission a serious blow. They could lose days on repairs. At this point, no one knows how things will turn out. Aboard Operation Loon's media ship, the Minibex, underwater cameraman Denis Lagrange and Popov, pilot of the submarine Remora, have received their assignment from Michel Loon. It would be good to go here and then along the side up to this zone, if we can get over it. But that's what we'll do. The Remora's mission today is to film the galley space, rich in everyday objects, for Lure's team. With their own images of this zone of the wreck, Dassault Systems engineers will reconstruct the Loon's galley in 3D for further study. Remora, authorization to dive granted. Copy that. Opening ballast. Lagrange and Popov have barely begun their descent when an alarm sounds. Carbon dioxide at dangerously high levels has just been detected in the tiny sub. The men could suffocate. Apparently, I have a problem here. My fan is not working. OK, come back up to the surface. We'll get ready to lift you out. The men are relieved. Another disaster is narrowly averted. 
For the moment, no one on the other ships is aware of this new incident. Then suddenly, there's impact. The remora has collided with the minibex, and the news travels quickly. Michel? Yes, Franca, I'm listening. I don't know if it's coming back on board or not. I think so, though. What a horrible day. Operation Loon seems to be courting disaster here, the same way the Sun King's ship did. I was coming up, getting close to the surface. I was holding the basket. The console of the arm fell and the joystick got twisted. Next thing, the submarine is flipped on its side. But it could have been much worse. Denis Lagrange's watertight camera housing also seems to have been damaged. We've got to take everything out, clean it all up, wash it, remove the salt. When it rains, it pours. The nude suit, the cameras, the remora. It couldn't get much worse. How the team will function with nothing but damaged submersibles is unclear. But this mission is, in part, a reconnaissance trip for the deep water dives to take place here over the next two years. It's best that the team face all serious obstacles now. Fate was crueler to the loon and its crew. Chronicles report that the arriving ship was stampeded by soldiers fleeing battle-torn Chigéry, and likely never even had time to offload its supplies. Nearly a thousand infantrymen, young nobles, and elite officers crowd the decks of Captain de Verdi's ship, hoping to soon set foot on French soil, if they survive. Misfortune was rife for the crew and men aboard the Lune. The hundreds of wounded who flooded the decks in bad shape in the wake of the siege of Gigéry. The ship must have looked like a floating hospital, overflowing with humanity and leaving the crew little maneuvering room. All the conditions were right for a difficult journey. Toutes les conditions dramatiques sont réunies pour avoir une navigation particulièrement compliquée. It takes four days for the Loon to cross the Mediterranean with a hundred men pumping water from the holds. Miraculously, the ship survives and anchors near Toulon. But they're forbidden to go ashore. Under the pretext that the plague is raging there, royal authorities order the captain to set sail for the Ier Islands to observe a quarantine period. De Verdi refuses, arguing that his ship is no longer seaworthy. A maritime carpenter is sent to inspect. Gédéon Rodolphe knows the loon well. He's the Royal Navy's official carpenter and supervised repairs of the ship only a few months prior. If the inspector fails to agree with the Look captain's concerns, De Verdi knows he'll have no recourse but to obey the king's orders and depart. The wood is in good shape. There are no leaks. This ship could sail around the world. Today, choppy seas and their own equipment woes have forced Operation Loon to cancel the day's dives. Instead, the mission is going to take a virtual turn on Dassault Systems' 3D diving simulator. 
Pilot Joe Kirsch tells Michel Lur how his own training on the virtual loon helped prepare him for the first newt suit dive. Now the expedition leader will see exactly how it works. On board the André Malraux, the Dassault systems engineers are setting up. They've been waiting to show the archaeologists results of their ongoing collaboration in 3D mapping of the loon. The controllers for the hands and the feet need to be taken out. The engineers walk Michel Lure through equipment functions and what to expect of the virtual experience. That's the right foot. So what we have here is the entire site of the shipwreck, about 600 square yards. And we can take control of both the ROV over there and the diving suit at the same time. There's an outside camera to help us move around the site. And of course, it's virtual reality. So we can also scout the wreck. There are cannons, cauldrons, and jars over there. Okay, now you're going to live Joe's experience. You tried it, and it works just like diving in the suit? <laughs> the first step when you enter the immersive world is to put on this 3D helmet that will isolate you from the outside world. I'd really like to have this technology at my disposal one day. To be able to work in the deep while I'm on the surface, to view the site in 3D with the helmet while staying dry, and to be on the shipwreck even if it's over a mile deep, that's to say, totally inaccessible. Do you feel like you're in the water? It's hard to explain what you feel because, well, you feel like you're in the water, the sight is familiar, so you feel like you can move around as much as you like once you've understood the movements, which is not always easy to figure out. The Dassault Systems team knows the detail of the virtual shipwreck should help the mission problem solve in their recovery efforts on the loon. It's morning on day three of Operation Loon. The seas have calmed and the newt suit has finally been repaired. So Michel Lure has ordered dives to resume on the shipwreck. The plan is to recover ceramic objects near the ship's anchor, if fortune is with them today. We try to conquer the loon every day. So far, each has brought its own share of problems. So we'll see today. Now the weather's a bit overcast, but it's actually good for working. So today should go well. Now, relief diver Emmerich Salvi will pilot the newt suit, giving Joe Kirsch time to rest up for demanding dives ahead. Today, Michel Lure will pair two devices on the sea floor, the manned newt suit to collect objects and the ROV for the security of the pilot and to monitor work on the wreck. The ROV can glide easily around the loon, but is less adept than the newt suit at gripping small objects.
the mute suit's manipulator jaws turn out to be as efficient as the team had hoped. And ceramics of varying sizes are making their way up to the surface. In the few remaining days at sea, the team will be able to collect only a few of the 60,000 artifacts they estimate are down here. But these first results are energizing for Lure's team. The team catalogs the artifacts and removes traces of salt here at sea. Restoration will take place in the lab. So the four you see here are ceramics. You see that? Small pots with handles. So they all have four handles. This one is slightly different because it has a spout. It's probably a little teapot or a small water jug. There are a lot of identical pots like this down there at the site. Of all the objects on deck, a large bottle captures Michel Lure's attention. This bottle in the museum, turned to the right, it'll be spectacular because once you've cleaned it, you'll see the beautiful green glass. It'll be a lovely piece. As for the plates, it'll be the same. Once you've cleaned them, they'll be beautiful. Yeah, they'll be spotless. Historical accounts indicate that the men on the loon drank heavily the night before the ship sank. The discomfort of being crammed onto a leaking ship under quarantine was perhaps more tolerable than the dangers of life at war in North Africa. When you crowd a ship in bad condition with so many men, you know it's risky. But at the time, the risk factor wasn't part of the equation. Only about a century later would authorities really become concerned about the health and survival of their crews. Concern for well-being would be an overstatement. So let's just say concern for better conditions on board. Clear to sail by Louis XIV's mandate the previous day, the loon is en route to quarantine in the Yer Islands the morning of November 6, 1664. Sprawled on deck and piled in the holds, most of the officers, soldiers, and crew are still recovering from the night's festivities. Without warning, the decaying ship suddenly gives out and sinks like a stone in just a few short minutes. According to survivors, the men on deck desperately leap into the sea the rest are trapped in the bowels of the sinking ship and drown. Only a few dozen men, including the captain, will survive. But the incident is promptly covered up by royal censors, and the fate of the loon and a thousand men soon forgotten. On day four of Operation Loon, Michel Lure is spending time in the virtual deep sea to instruct newt suit diver Joe how and where to collect two large earthenware jars. The pilot is picking up some useful pointers. I see Michel trying to put his right arm into the jar. With a 15-inch tool, we could probably remove some sand. I'd like you to go look at the jars on the aft port side. Paul Henri and I suggested using a little rake like tool to remove sediments from inside the jars. It would lighten their weight. We feel it's the easiest and most practical way to extract the jars. Thank you. 
After a couple of days of repairs, the submarine Remora is preparing for its first descent to film the wreck. Cameraman Denis Lagrange hopes they'll have more success this time. After all that's happened, it's getting more exciting now. Popoff is eager to go, and I hope we'll finally get to the loon. With less than 48 hours left to survey and pull artifacts from the wreck on this reconnaissance mission, Michel Lure deploys his full underwater armada. Surface, Remora here. We're starting to work on the shipwreck. Remora, surface here. Copy that. At depths of 300 feet, the images are otherworldly, revealing details of a shipwreck never before captured with such clarity. Piloting the nude suit takes stamina. Two motors keep the suit weightless but it takes muscle to move limbs and free the earthenware food jars from the sand. The work is tiring. There's a suction effect holding the jars in place. If Joe rushes, he risks breaking them. Night has fallen and exhaustion sets in. Bad weather has hampered the team's work and now it may not be safe to raise the jars. And he can put two, three or four of them in. Then they'll raise it with a small hook and place everything in the crate for large objects. Okay, but our problem is that we can't dive under the Jason at night. And I think that bringing the objects back up full of water without properly securing them is unsafe for the objects. Yet again, the team is thwarted in its efforts to mine the mysteries of the loon. But out here, weather can't be ignored. Unwilling to put divers and artifacts at risk, Michel Lure cancels the operation. After hours on the loon, Joe is disappointed to return empty-handed. Tomorrow he'll have one last chance to bridge the gap between the silent ship and the team that would tell its story. It's daybreak on the final day of Operation Loon. Now every minute counts. The team must still collect the earthenware jars and Michel Lure would like to find out if it's possible to raise a much larger object, a cauldron. Once again, the newt suit will be put to the test.
Collecting artifacts like the cauldron is essential for the mission to learn more about the loon and its history. But their primary aim is to test combinations of high-tech underwater tools that will permit them to perform research at extreme depths. He's on the left side, trying to position the lines, one in front of him and the other in back, to the Gorgon's right, so probably to your left. We'll lift it really slowly. Everyone is on edge after the mission's early mechanical glitches. They hope all equipment will function properly, confirming that their strategies for future efforts are heading in the right direction. The light's not causing a problem for you? No, negative. I'm fine. The pressure applied by the robot's jaws must be just right. Once they're firmly in place, Joe carefully moves the cauldron into a waiting basket. lifted by crane to the surface. At last, the loon shares one of its secrets with the impatient archaeologists. Success with this maneuver at depths of 300 feet is an encouraging sign for deeper dives. As for the cauldron itself, the size alone indicates the loon had a very large galley. The team looks for engravings that might be revealing. There's something, see? There might be something there. Here, I see something that... It's blue, I think. Titanic diver Paul-Henri Narjolet feels the high-tech pairings tested here will usher in a new era of underwater exploration. It's not too deep here, so it's a place where we can perfect techniques to apply to other wrecks. Because there's not only the Titanic. I'm working on other shipwrecks, and I intend to continue using this type of technique elsewhere. With luck now on his side, but time running out, Michel Lure presents the team with one last major challenge. The divers of the Sophismer team will try to lift a bronze cannon from the wreck. This is the tool the French Navy uses to remove torpedoes from the ocean floor. A thick rubber lining should protect the cannon from damage. It's a dangerous job. The loon's cannon weighs nearly two tons and is still half buried in the sand. For security reasons, no humans will be allowed at the wreck site. Aboard the Andre Malraux, the tension is palpable. Recovering this symbolic vestige of Louis XIV's navy would be a true prize. But it's too big a job with too little time to go. Michel Lure is forced to call it off. This is the only time when I do my job that I feel this emotional. I like the idea that it shouldn't be easy, that sometimes the shipwrecks refuse to yield. It's the rule of the game. And if it were too easy, it would be less fun. His team is equally philosophical. It's a deep and difficult site, but we knew that. There were a lot of technological challenges as well. Just now, it was the cannon that resisted. But then again, we didn't get to work on it as much as we'd have liked to. We'll just have to be patient and pick it up next time. 
It's better to collect it when the conditions are right rather than pull it up damaged. After five intense days and nights at sea, phase one of Operation Loon is complete. Now Michel Lure's alliance of science, 3D tech, and military experts will regroup for two years of Loon exploration ahead. Touching the first vestiges of the 17th century warship is only the first step. The marriage of science and high technology here is about to make exploration of the planet's last frontier, the ocean, just a little more exciting. Mapping and reconstructing the loon in 3D will make it possible for the team to explore the wreck with greater awareness at sea or in the comfort of the laboratory. At last, the loon can reveal her secrets, and a dark chapter in the Sun King's reign will finally come to light.